Uh, this evening we'll be meeting a couple of our TUS candidates and hearing from hearing from them um, and having a bit of a discussion at the end and some time for questions. Um, I will quickly introduce myself. My name's Molly. I am a recently joined member of the Leeds Socialist Party. Uh, I'm a student, I am a shop worker and for that and many other reasons I'll be voting Tusk in the May elections. Um, this is all fairly new to me so this is going to be a really interesting evening for me as I hope it will be for you guys. Um, this is also my first hosting of anything so bear with me if I fumble a little bit. Um, so a little structure um, for the meeting, we'll be hearing from four speakers, um, just a little bit of what they are running for in the election. Um, then we will open up for questions and contributions at the end. Uh, if you've got anything to say, just keep it in your mind and we'll have time for it then. So our first speaker will actually be Amy Murphy. She's a lifelong trade union activist. Um, she's an amazing woman, a member of the Tusk National Steering Committee, uh, former president of the Retail Workers Union, USDOR, for three years, and prior to that, an EC member for six years. So it's going to be really interesting to hear from her. Over to you, Amy. And um, good evening, comrades, and, and thank you um, very much for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, you know, exciting times ahead. Um, yeah, <laughs> so we, you know, I'm Amy Murphy. I'm formerly, as been said, the uh, president of our store. Um, you know, we have seen our, our membership um, plummet um, in the last couple of years, mainly due to, um, you know, the high streets failing, um, with no help from the government. You know, the rates are, are, are massively high. Um, you know, they, they don't seem to care this government doesn't care about anyone other than themselves and, and our members um, are suffering massively. Um, I suppose one of the reasons, um, you know, I'm, I'm standing on, on the Tusk Committee, which uh, for me is a, a real privilege. Um, just like to give you a bit of an insight, I suppose. Um, I joined the Tusk Steering Committee primarily it's pretty simple um, because it does offer the working class a real alternative um, to Johnson's Tories and Starmer's Labour. Um, you know, there, there is no opposition other than Tusk in my eyes um, towards Johnson and his cronies. Um, you know, with Johnson and the Tories putting the, the interests of big business way before um, safety during this pandemic, you know, with, with the death toll the way it is. Um, you know, the lack of PPE at the beginning um, and the general sleaze of, of this government, you know, it, you, you couldn't make it up. It's, it's absolutely outrageous. Um, and I believe that Tusk is a real political voice which highlights a government that is rotten to the core, um, which puts it, its profits of the rich minority way before, you know, above um, the working class majority. Um, you only have to look at the outrageous offer of 1% uh, for the national health workers. Um, it's an absolute insult. You know, these workers, law workers that have put, you know, people before themselves, um, they struggle throughout this pandemic, putting their, their families at risk, themselves at risk, working without the correct PPE, um, the back-to-back -back shifts, many of which were 12 hours or more, um, you know, carrying on their shifts, even though um, you know, they can hardly stand up, let alone, you know, they're not eating, they're not getting proper breaks, but they do it. And why do they do it? Because they care. And this government doesn't care about anyone. They don't care any of that. Um, I mean, that just goes to sort of ask the question, what, what kind of a government would do that? Um, so, you know, we need some, you know, a party that will, will challenge that and, and will we'll take that on. Um, the Tories continued aggression towards trade unionists, as we've known for a while. Um, you know, whenever there's a, a Conservative government, they'll always try and, you know, cut the unions down, silence them. And with a new bill that's uh, going through Parliament, or, or though it's been halted for a little bit, but, you know, the Police, Crime and Sentences and Courts Bill, which seriously undermines the right to protest. Um, you know, we need the right to protest, the right to strike to protect jobs, um, to, you know, fight against further austerity. Um, 
and you know these are paramount and and that again is just another way of of just stamping their their authority on the working classes and and you know making them um their voices stifled um and you know so we must stop this bill in its tracks it's crucial um allowing businesses to cull their work their workforces um you know every day you know in in the retail industry jobs are being cut um premiums are being cut you know terms and conditions are being eroded away um and it's making the, you know the working class are the ones that are being made to pay for this pandemic they're not the ones that that messed up the government are the ones that messed up so why should we pay for their for their mistakes um the emergence you know of, of hire and refire you know it fire and rehire sorry which is spreading like the virus allowing these unscrupulous companies to continue to to you know do their workers down and um, british gas british airways um it's rearing its head in all kinds of, of industries and and it's growing you know spreading like wildfire ac across um the country and and if we again no opposition to it you know no one seems to apart from tusk candidates that offer um some kind of a you know a, a way out of it i suppose um because labor's no opposition um and as i've already said this this conservative government doesn't care about anyone other than themselves and the big businesses i mean starmer's labor is no longer a, a viable um option for low-paid workers um you know we need a party that is going to stand up for the, the working class we need councillors that will stand up and fight for the working class, their fundamental rights, um, which clearly, you know, the Tories don't and Labour don't. But I truly believe that Tusk candidates would. Um, and I think that Tusk candidates could make a real mark in the forthcoming elections. Um, so I, I would like to put on record, you know, congratulating all the Tusk candidates for standing and, you know, and putting themselves forward um and some of the fantastic campaign uh, the campaigns that they've run and are, are in you know in the middle of running um you know the enthusiasm um you know standing up for the working class um i, I actually you know take my hat off to them because you know people are looking for an alternative and and whereas that you know tusk perhaps wasn't um obviously known that well um i've been talking to people about tusk and and, and the name's out there, you know? So I think, you know, now is the time that Tusk could really have a platform to, to make a difference. Um, and I hope that the voters see that. Um, they see that, you know, there is no hope in Labour, there is no hope in the Conservatives. Um, the only way forward for the working class is a, is a, a political party like Tusk. Um, so I really hope, um, you know, that on May the 6th, um, things really do do work for the candidates um, and it certainly won't be for the you know the want to try and so I want to offer my full solidarity and I'm really looking forward to hearing tonight the candidates speaking um, you know I've listened to uh, I've done a few zooms where you know we've had other candidates and and I say I you know I'm throwing my weight fully behind them and I say well done and solidarity to you all thank you Thank you so much for speaking, Amy. I think a lot of what you said just resonates with all of us and why we're here at this meeting tonight. Um, we've got our second candidate now to speak. It's Mick Griffiths. Sorry, um, He's a Tusk candidate for Wakefield East Ward. Uh, Mick was actually formerly the secretary of the Mid Yorkshire Hospital Unison branch, um, as well as the secretary of the Wakefield Anti-Poll Tax Federation. So again, going to be really interesting to hear from him. Over to you, Mick. Thank you. I'll first uh, give a bit of background to NHS and the state that it's in at the moment. Um, back in the early 90s, it was Thatcher's government that really made the first inroad into breaching the founding principles of what the health service was set up for and to do by their introduction into the NHS of uh, an internal competitive market. These reforms abolished the old uh, health authorities that uh, 
were running health services at the time and uh, brought in the current NHS hospital trust that we've had ever since then. And uh, purchasing and provision of services were basically split into two distinct separate entities. Trusts were uh, to be standalone business units and competition for resources became the driving force of as NHS. And after the Tories, when Blair came in, the Blair governments just expanded and intensified that market competitive uh, reform. And uh, particularly so with the uh, introduction and uh, complete intensification with private finance initiative uh, programmes for new hospitals uh, developments. So much so that within nine years of Blair governments, Labour managed to actu actually privatise more than double the amount of public assets that the previous Tory governments had done in their 18 years of office. So in other words, Blair's Labour governments privatised at four times the rate than what the previous Tories had. Since then, obviously, we've seen even further protracted fragmentation and piecemeal privatisation of uh, health as well as other public services. It's all continued unabated. However, with the outbreak of the COVID, government was forced to completely reverse, well, not completely reverse, but they had to break with the competitive arrangements within NHS. Market forces and competitive tendering for services was deemed not fit for purpose, although they've only done this as a temporary expedient necessity. Some of the public may think uh, what cell services got to do with local council elections. Well, a lot of public may not realise that councillors sit on various overview and scrutiny committees and the council's health scrutiny committee has the duty to scrutinise any substantial proposed health service changes. Can also present alternatives and vote down any changes which it believes are not in the best interests of the public. The committees can also request that the Secretary of State for Health considers requirement for independent reviews. Well, Wakefield councillors so far have ultimately rubber stamped with no resistance whatsoever everything that's happened in NHS. In fact, most challenges to government and any reversals of proposals that are forthcoming, wherever they've occurred, usually it's only when there's been mass public campaigns are they uh, beaten ultimately. When our union branch presented Wakefield Council's Health Committee with a detailed commissioned report against the business plan for the Pinderfields Hospital's private finance development, it was uni unanimously uh, accepted by the councillors in, in a discussion that only took about five minutes. Well, there were no discussion. The proposals were presented and they all voted for them. Although at the time, there were actually one councillor who did voice some concern. His concern was that they should be careful in accepting a deal which were based on commercial confidentiality constraints. And the deal didn't present any financial information whatsoever were provided. However, even that solitary voice of concern, when it came to the uh, minutes being produced, they were not even they were not even documented that point of concern and, and the councillor that did raise the concern were independent so the now we've got tories pushing latest nhs reforms where they're presenting a white paper called a blueprint for NHS and social care reform following the pandemic. Allegedly, these changes 
are to do with uh, learning lessons. In fact, they say they're embedding lessons learned from the uh, pandemic. And we can all guess what sort of lessons they're learning and the intentions they're going to have. I mean, under these proposals, first and foremost, it's going to open up health services to potential wholesale regionalised privatisation. Also, it could be a good method whereby any localised mass campaigns against service changes could be easily circumvented. You can't trust the Tories because they speak with forked tongues every time, every time they open their mouths. What they privately intend to do is the exact opposite of what they're publicly declaring. What's needed is not more or less privatisation. What is needed is complete reversal of and abol abolition of all privatisation in the NHS. This was uh, one of the uh, Labour's manifesto commitments at last general election under Corbyn's leadership. Whilst Keir Starmer has not yet publicly repudiated this policy. So you can't trust Labour either. We've seen what they're like when they're serving big business, in, you know, as opposed to uh, ordinary people's interests. These, these new uh, reforms, they're proposing for legal changes to impose so-called integrated care systems, which were previously defined as uh, sustainability and transformation plans, a more accurate description of what they're really all about. Because in other words, what they stipulate is that funding for any services is only centrally provided when efficiency savings is approved, approved as a result. And pots of funds are also potentially to be rationed, rationed out and provided on a sub-regional basis as opposed to funding on a district-wide basis. Legal duties of health providers and responsibilities are allegedly to local populations that they serve. But these legal changes that they're aiming for, it's going to bring in and I'll have that double impact. It's obviously aimed at putting more into the uh, private sectors and as we've seen with ex the experience of the pandemic has been that billions and billions and billions of mons monies have been frittered away to private providers to the tune of 400 million a month and this is just going into shares and profits as opposed to services and we need a uh, counter alternative plan about real investment in fully funded public NHS services. Recent report done by uh, Health Campaigns Together highlights that just to stand still and provide current services, 12 billion is needed in extra investment and you know the money shouldn't be just about buildings and equipment but biggest asset at NHS is its staff and being paid properly instead of being privatised out and on poor pay and conditions. So all of these uh, counter proposals that TUS would put as we've always put are what has to be fought for and mass campaigns to see them being implemented. Otherwise, uh, the latest reforms that they're sneaking in, no one knows about it. Our clinical commissioning group put out a consultation end of last year, three months, nobody heard anything about it. It said it was uh, consulting with interested parties and our health scrutiny committee on the council hasn't even commented on it, not raised no concerns, not even said that you know it's it, it's dubious and uh, we've just got to expose these councillors on health committees that's just rubber stamping everything and not raising an alternative to it they're, they're not even discussing it on their uh, website in the uh, council papers they're not even mentioning anything about this and they're trying to have it up and running by next April. They're already presenting with integrated care systems applications, which means abolition of uh, the actual clinical commissioning groups. 
that's coming up with the uh, consultation over it and uh, you know the public are blissfully unaware of what's going on and they're trying to under radar at covid conditions bring in these major changes and change the law so that they can basically privatize health services beyond anything that's happened so far which is hard to believe because after all these years it feels like all oh, public assets must have nearly gone by now but no there's uh, more to come as they try to sneak it towards Americanized type healthcare instead of back to the founding principles of what it should be. I'll leave it at that, thank you. Thank you so much for speaking Mick, that was great. Um, so we'll be passing on next to Jay Slate and Jocelyn. Uh, Jay is the task candidate Beeston and Holbeck in Leeds. Uh, he was formerly a Labour Party member under Corbyn but decided to join the Leeds, Le Leeds Socialist Party branch last year and has followed through with uh, standing as an election candidate. So it's nice to hear. Uh, thanks very much comrades. Um, yeah thank you it's a real honour just to be able to speak and kind of go into this and sorry if it kind of sounds a bit self-indulgent if I talk about myself too much but I just think kind of me getting interested in politics and kind of the left wing through Jeremy Corbyn and kind of my, you know, since he left the Labour, isn't the leader of the opposition and kind of how that disinfluenced me with the Labour Party is kind of quite similar to people my age. And because I was kind of what the media kind of correctly guessed that when Corbyn took over the Labour Party, I was kind of this younger generation who wasn't part of kind of following politics too much and kind of um, when he got elected I was kind of awakened to this idea that for some people it's a radical idea about equality and focusing on all these social issues and to me it just made common sense and I was kind of shocked that the opposition had to put that forward so kind of even though I was kind of grew up obviously most of my childhood was dominated by Tony Blair and I kind of saw the atrocities he committed it was kind of the first time that I felt like I, there was somebody who kind of represented my interests, especially as kind of I was becoming an adult myself. And kind of, I wasn't the most active member. I kind of, I was on a student membership, so I was at university at the time. So that was kind of taking, you know, one pound out of my bank account each month. And I didn't join many socials or kind of take part. So it's kind of still a growing period for me to kind of get used to it and kind of realise that the impact, because I think kind of, yeah, it's a big organisation, you wonder kind of how much your impact can have. And I think it's a bit taken away from the working class movement that it started with. And so when Jeremy Corbyn resigned, which is obviously a big you know, matter for another longer than five minute speech, um, I was kind of disillusioned and I thought, what came next? You know, I took part in the voting for the next Labour candidate and the Socialist candidate didn't win. And ultimately then kind of what I was left with was Keir Starmer and then kind of seeing how, especially across the pandemic, kind of Labour's just been rejecting so much of its younger left youth as a result. And I think kind of that's the biggest thing that we have to face now is we've seen that there's a whole generation of people and it's not just restricted to younger generations, I think, as conversations like this across you know such a wide berth of people can show is that we've seen that there can be an opposition but it's just not the opposition that we have and realistically what they're doing is taking steps to make sure that we can't that they're not going to be seen as that to us and so when I was attracted to the Socialist Party I was very aware that I didn't want to have something that was in action. I didn't kind of want to have something that I was just speaking to friends about and kind of complaining because I reached the point where I was kind of thinking that inaction was basically allowing it and just by not fighting and kind of taking part in building the future that I wanted, I was allowing the kind of conservatives to win. So when, so when I decided to run for task, it's true because I think that what we have to do is convince everyone who is disillusioned with this idea of the left that they need to turn their disillusionment and anger into action and it's not an easy 
you know, it's just not as easy as freezing water to turn it into ice. It's not, there's no method for it. And we need to kind of work on how we're going to do that. But ultimately, I think that by going out there and being, doing honest work and doing stalls and showing that we're anti-austerity by fighting for working class votes that even if they don't directly benefit us, but understanding that they benefit society and everything as a whole will lead to building a better future and a working class revolution. So that's kind of why I'm standing for Tusk. And I think it's a party that will continue to grow and reach out. And especially as we see over the months and the handling of the pandemic, we'll kind of lock in more of the disillusioned Labour voters. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. That was great. And uh, thank you for speaking. Uh, we're going to hand over now, uh, last but not least, to Ian Dalton, a uh, test candidate for Gipton and Hare Hills in Leeds. Ian is the chair of the Usdor Broad Left um, as, as a former shop steward, um, and he's the chair, uh, the chair of the successful Save Fernville Fields campaign in Leeds. So it's going to be interesting to hear from him too. Over to you, Ian. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Molly. Um, so over, over the last decade or so, the five councils across West Yorkshire have lost around a billion pounds in financing by central government, with over 10,000 jobs lost as a result. Uh, this year, we're going to see over a thousand jobs lost across West Yorkshire. Um, and those are all jobs cut by Labour, by Labour who run all five uh, of the councils, either as a majority or as a, a you know, ruling, uh, 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 you know, it's the largest party on the council. Um, we've seen strikes a couple of years ago against Bradford Council by libraries, art galleries and museum workers in Unite uh, against cuts and proposed closures. But those sorts of cuts to libraries, to data centres and other services have all taken place over that last uh, 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 decade. And now with COVID, councils are making even more cuts or planning to do so in the future. Uh, Leeds City Council are closing uh, re a recycling centre, two care homes, children's centres, sports facilities, Crown Green Bowl in Greens uh, and more that they've announced uh, uh, in this year's budget. Uh, uh, in Calderdale, uh, the council there are reducing the opening hours of recycling centre. And even if there's not necessarily stuff uh, uh, immediate, on the cards in other councils, then uh, uh, you know it's more a case of uh, uh, Biden the time uh, for much bigger cuts in years to uh, come. And on the Leeds Tusk website, you can download a report that we produced into the council budget proposal across West Yorkshire. And one of the things you'll see in that is you know depend you know despite uh, you know there've been more cuts in Leeds and not so much in other cities, every single one of those councils are increasing council tax and are increasing the adult social precepts, making working class people pay more for the services uh, uh, that are still there. Uh, in most of West Yorkshire, then the reason why Labour runs the councils is because working class people voted Labour uh, in opposition to Tory cuts. However, when those same councillors elected uh, uh, go into the council chambers, then they're the ones uh, as we've seen, have been carrying them out. And Tusk says as an alternative, we need councillors who refuse to vote for cuts and instead campaign for the funding necessary to fund the services our, com our communities need. However, we're clear that it's not uh, uh, by councillors fighting alone that this can be changed. Those councillors need to try and organise a mass movement around them to fight back against the cuts and force the government to cough up the resources necessary. This was a route taken by the militant-led Liverpool City Council in the 1980s, where mass struggle, including uh, a one-day general strike in the city, but also mass demonstrations, mass meetings and discussion and debate, uh, where that struggle around uh, a deficit budget won funding from the government to the tune of £30 million uh, uh, back in 1984 and was able to lead to the building of 5,000 new council homes, new parks and all sorts of other facilities, whilst also creating a thousand jobs uh, in the city, providing that. Today, given the changes in laws around council financing, then we would argue it's actually easier for councils to embark on such a struggle today. Uh, after Liverpool the Liverpool uh, city councillors were stabbed in the back by Neil Kinnock, then Labour leader, the councillors were removed from office and surcharged, but the power to surcharge councillors has since been gotten rid of. 
The only major change uh, uh, that you'd need to that strategy today would be to argue for using council reserves and prudent borrowing powers in the short term to balance a budget whilst campaigning to win the necessary money back. And of course, there are those who say that, well, you can't do this, those reserves are for a rainy day. Uh, and that, but I don't know if anyone <laughs> hasn't uh, uh, noticed, but cuts have been pouring down over the last decade. Uh, uh, and that if it's not raining now, when it when is it? Incidentally, several West Yorkshire councils have actually drawn down on their reserves uh, uh, this year, including councils who uh, uh, are considering or have unearmarked reserves set aside for fixed purposes, which just shows how that could, how that is possible and can be done. Uh, uh, and that the problem however, with how these councils have done it, is that they don't plan to use that to force the funding necessary from the government to retain services in the long run, or in, are instead frittering those reserves away uh, uh, piecemeal. Bradford Council are even using that, uh, you know, reserves to restore the funding to some services that they've cut because of COVID, only to announce they're getting rid of them in a year or two after the pandemic, uh, which is, you know, is, is uh, absolutely scandalous. But we don't get wait for count to get councillors elected to fight back. We get involved in those community campaigns and trade union struggles where we can, and we try and initiate them if we have to. When Unite Community in Leeds was helping parents uh, of special education uh, uh, needs and disabilities, uh, 16 to 18 year old students, uh, uh, fight back against cuts to their transport to school, we joined that campaign and fully backed it, which forced the council back uh, in Leeds. When the council in Leeds planned to build on the Fernville playing fields that Molly mentioned, I was the chair of the campaign uh, there and other Socialist Party members were involved alongside other people from the local communities and independent councillor uh, uh, and others. Then we joined that campaign. We helped organise a public meeting. We helped organise a campaign in the press. An online, you know, an online petition uh, was set up as well. And that forced the council to backtrack on that. And we still have... Uh, the local playing field uh, in the ward that I'm standing in because of that campaign. Not all of the campaigns we can get involved in are successful. Um, you know, we were involved in uh, a campaign that we initiated in Bradford against the closure of the St Edmund Street Day Centre, sorry, Edmund Street Day Centre uh, in the city centre, um, you know, and we weren't able to win that. But in fighting these cuts, we can expose the fact that there is an alternative to passing on Tory cuts and help build the confidence and organisation in our working class communities and trade unions to engage in the fight necessary to resist them. And like with the bedroom tax, where we fought that in a whole number of, of the different areas across West Yorkshire, then we were, eight, you know, whilst we didn't stop uh, uh, the bedroom tax altogether, we were able to help people fight, resist eviction, and, and in some cases, force councils to cough up extra funding to help people stay in their homes. Through doing this, we help demonstrate the need for a mass workers party that goes into the council chamber and backs our struggles 100%, which we in the Socialist Party see Tusk as a crucial step towards building. So I'd say to anybody in the meeting uh, and watching this who isn't involved in Tusk already, then get active with us, get in touch through our website, join one of our constituent organisations, such as the Socialist Party, because we need you to get involved in the struggle uh, uh, to help fight austerity and to help transform society. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for speaking, Ian. Um, it was really brilliant to hear from all of you. Uh, it's very inspiring to hear such knowledge and passion from all of our TUS candidates and their knowledge extending over so many different areas of what they care about um, and showing us what they're going to do to stop cuts. Um, it feels really important and affirming so we can all confirm why we're voting for them and why we're here at this meeting.